German philosopher and precursor to postmodernism, Nietzsche was one of the most fascinating and influential thinkers within the last 200 years. Nietzsche was born on October 15, 1844 in the Saxon village of Rocken. His family was of a deeply rooted Christian background. His mother was descended from five generations of Lutheran pastors, while his father was the local pastor of his village. Growing up in an authentic Lutheran household, Nietzsche was introduced to the ideas of Christianity at an early age. Despite his upbringing, however, Nietzsche would prove to be a harsh critic of the religion going into his adult years. At the age of five, Nietzsche would suffer a major blow with the death of his father, leaving him in the care of his mother, grandmother, several aunts, and his older sister Elizabeth. Nietzsche and his family moved to the nearby village of Nomburg in April of 1850 shortly afterwards. Attending local schools for several years, Nietzsche would receive a letter from one of the best boarding schools in all of Germany, Forte, offering him a scholarship. It's here at Forte that Nietzsche's study of science would begin to undermine his faith. By the end of this period of schooling, Nietzsche would no longer accept Christianity. In 1864, drawn by the university's notable philologist, Nietzsche would enroll at the University of Bonn. He would pursue classical studies along with classical philology. Due to the university's expensive nature, Nietzsche would transfer to the University of Leipzig. His student years here have been described as the best in his entire life. Nietzsche's early publications in the field of philology would land him a position at the University of Basel in Switzerland in 1869 teaching classical philology, despite the fact that Nietzsche had yet to earn his degree. While at Basel, Nietzsche published his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, in 1872. Although finding success at the university, Nietzsche's teaching duties were constantly interrupted by prolonged bouts of sickness. Nietzsche also served during this time in the Franco-Prussian War, but it only served to further aggravate his sickness. By April of 1879, Nietzsche's health had deteriorated to a devastating point. He faced repeated attacks of vomiting and headaches. In light of his condition, he was forced to resign from his professorship. The university granted him a small pension for the contributions he had made over the years. Wishing to leave Basel for a climate more suitable to his condition, Nietzsche would begin a 10-year journey of wandering. His travels taking him to the mountains of southern Europe, Nietzsche would become somewhat of a nomad. Although his disease became progressively worse, it is during this time that Nietzsche would produce the majority of his most famous and provocative works as a philosopher. On January 3rd, 1889, Nietzsche suffered a collapse in the streets of Italy. Regaining consciousness, he had lost all sanity. Taken to his mother's home to be cared for, Nietzsche would fall further into madness until his death on August 25th, 1900. When Nietzsche first appeared on the philosophical scene, he sought to redefine philosophy. In his book Beyond Good and Evil, published in 1886, Nietzsche provided a scathing critique of philosophers. Philosophers bore their beliefs out of a false sense of truth-seeking. Instead, they were built on prejudices. A man's philosophy told you more about the person than did objective reality. Nietzsche instead longed for free spirits, individuals who would be fully independent thinkers, free of dogmatism. The ultimate realization of this idea would be Nietzsche's concept of the superman, or overman. For Nietzsche, man was but a stepping stone to something higher. The overman represents the next evolution of mankind, a person free from prejudices and faulty morality, who establishes his own values and purpose. In his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, published in 1883, Nietzsche puts it this way, The most careful asks today, how is man to be maintained? Zarathustra asks, however, the first and only one, how is man to be surpassed? The values of the world, according to Nietzsche, were insufficient. Nietzsche claimed traditional morality has been a prejudice, perhaps a prematureness, but in any case, something to be surmounted. He focused his criticism primarily around the European Christianity of his time. The Christian faith required the sacrifice of all freedom, all pride, all self-confidence of spirit. It is at the same time subjection, self-derision, and self-mutilation. It takes for granted that the subjection of the spirit is indescribably painful. For Nietzsche, Christianity was nothing short of irrational. The religion elevated the weak over the strong. What were completely natural and beneficial human traits and instincts were denied for the sake of morality. Man should instead embrace these fundamental desires. Exalt these inherent qualities of life, not life's inherent suffering. Nietzsche put forth that humans are primarily driven by innate will to power. All organic functions could be traced back to this will to power. In fact, the entire universe operates on this concept. Everything will endeavor to grow, to gain ground, attract itself, and acquire ascendancy, not owing to any morality or immorality. Life is precisely will to power. Nietzsche didn't necessarily mean domination here. He more so meant that humans naturally seek to grow, to improve, and to increase. Life has a kind of exuberance to it. This shouldn't be denied, as Christianity attempted to do. In a world where Christianity was progressively seen as a less and less satisfactory way to explain the world with the emergence of modern science, Nietzsche would make his most famous declaration. God is dead. Most notable for its inclusion in Nietzsche's Parable of the Madman in The Gay Science, published in 1882, the proverb provided a sobering warning. Nietzsche was never fond of Christianity, but it did serve a purpose. Having looked to it for hundreds of years for values and guidance, what would humanity look to now that they had killed him? The world was becoming increasingly nihilistic. It just didn't quite know it. Nietzsche's philosophy was very much an answer to this crisis. 
One final idea that Nietzsche posited was his concept of eternal recurrence, the idea that events will occur again and again in an infinite cycle. Nietzsche thought this was a joyful truth. If someone could embrace this internal recurrence with happiness, it would be the quintessential expression of Nietzsche's life-affirming attitude. Spanish philosopher George Santayana was remorselessly critical of Nietzsche's ethics. He believed Nietzsche was an egotist. Ironically, similar to Nietzsche's own criticism of philosophers, Santayana thought Nietzsche's philosophy was majorly a result of his own personal tastes and biases rather than him attempting to form an objective account of reality. For all of his talk of transcending morality, Nietzsche wasn't actually against it, for he had his own concept of morality he wished to impose on the world. Instead, Santayana claims Nietzsche only sought to bring down Christianity specifically. Nietzsche based all his doctrine on his own preferences. For example, Nietzsche thinks power represents good, so he encouraged everyone to take this view. Democracy, on the other hand, was disliked by Nietzsche, so he condemns it in the strongest of terms. His concept of power didn't have any real meaning either in Santayana's mind. The word power is used in a variety of ways throughout his works, each with a different meaning. He talks highly of this concept of will to power, but it's void of any true application due to its ambiguity. What this power would be when attained and exercised is unclear. Nietzsche simply praises it because he likes it. This speaks to a more general problem with Nietzsche as a writer. His writing style is unconventional and at times can be hard to understand. Other ideas of Nietzsche's, such as fraternal recurrence, still lack a consensus as to their actual meanings. Eternal recurrence is also Nietzsche's ego at play, according to Santayana. It's nothing more than a symbol of self-approval on the world's part. Even the Superman is a selfish reaction. Human life repelled Nietzsche, so he created a vision of man that would right the wrongs of his life. Essentially, Santayana saw Nietzsche's philosophy as nothing more than a cynical response to a reality he despised, a reality that had treated him poorly. Santayana can't help but see the parallels between Nietzsche's ideas and his tragic existence, and at times, the incoherence of his thoughts. Nietzsche's theories had a deep influence in continental Europe during the 20th century. In English-speaking countries, however, he was not so positively received. Nietzsche's ideas were largely embraced by the Nazis and Italian fascist parties during the 1930s. This was in part due to his sister Elizabeth's association with Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. As a result of this association, Nietzsche's philosophy wouldn't be legitimately considered in English-speaking countries until the 1950s and 1960s. Nietzsche was especially influential in French philosophical circles during the 60s through the 1980s due to his perspectivism and identification of power as the driving human motivator. Nietzsche had an incredible influence on several notable theorists and philosophers, including the likes of Sartre, Heidegger, Camus, and others. Even his explanation of values through the lens of animalistic instincts was crucial for the development of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis. In many ways, Nietzsche's philosophy was the bedrock for 20th century psychology and philosophy, embedding the progression of philosophical thought and key postmodern thinkers going into the postmodern era.